Good morning. A big warm welcome to HGSE. I want to talk to you about a more heavy duty topic, the morally dangerous time that we live in, a time when too many people seem self-interested and self-protective, a time when bigotry is emboldened, and that when the things that divide us seem thick and the things that unite us seem thin. I want to share some brief thoughts about how we got here, and I want to talk about how we can get to a better place. Um, I don't think there's a simple answer to how we got here. It's a puzzle with many pieces, but I think our research highlights one of those pieces. So we have been asking uh, middle school and high school students, we've been trying to understand how much they value happiness, achievement, and caring, and how they see the relationship between these values. By now, we've surveyed about 10,000 middle and high school students from every region of the country, very diverse. And we've asked them versions of this question. What's most important to you, being happy, achieving it at a high level, or caring about others? We've also asked them, how do you imagine your parents would rank these things for you? Is it more important to your parents that you're happy, that you're high achieving, or that you care for others? And, you know, people mean very different things by these words, achievement, caring, and happiness. And we've asked them, what do you mean by achievement? What do you mean by caring? What do you mean by happiness? And what do you see as the relationship between these things? In a nutshell, this is what we found. We found that caring comes in third, that students, this is a diverse sample of students from across the country, are about twice as likely to rank their achievement as more important than their caring. Happiness is complicated, but put another way, about 80% are ranking some aspect of their success, either achievement or happiness, as more important than their caring. We've also asked parents this question, how would you rank these values? And parents quite clearly say that they say the most important value to them is that their kids grow up to be caring. It's not achievement. But we ask kids, how do you imagine, young people, how do you imagine your parents would rank these things for you? What do you think they said? So young people are about three times more likely to think that their parents would rank achievement as more important than caring. So there is this gap between what parents are espousing and what young people are absorbing. Similarly, youth were three times more likely to agree than disagree with this statement on our survey. My parents are prouder if I get good grades in my classes than if I'm a caring community member in class in school. We also asked, sorry, we, we missed a slide. We also asked parents, uh, how do you imagine other parents in your community would rank these values? What's common among other parents in your community? What do you, how do you think they answered that question? Achievement. So they're about four times more likely to think that other parents in their community value achievement over caring. So we have a situation here where the great majority of parents think that the problem is a great majority of other parents. <laughs> so there are many causes to this. I mean, one is that it is mothers, it used to be throughout most of our history, mothers' responsibility to raise children who were caring, ethical citizens. It should have been fathers as well. Um, it is no longer mother's responsibility. The, the, the messages that kids are getting from their parent are prioritizing achievement. Schools in this country, you may know, were founded not to promote academic achievement primarily, but they were founded to develop, and skill, the, to develop in students the skills and commitments they needed to be caring and ethical citizens. Our founders of our, the founders of our schools recognized that there is nothing about democracy that is indestructible or foolproof or magical. It depends on people who are constructive and engaged in ethical citizens. Colleges, including this one, were founded primarily to promote ethical character. It is hard to find a college now that promotes ethical character strongly, a place where ethical character, ethical values really live and breathe. Religious institutions, I'm not saying anything positive or negative about any particular religious belief, but I want you to consider for a minute the structure of religions for a minute. They are places where kids are in contact with adults who stand for common values, where there are ethical questions that are asked, where there are ethical rituals, where there are coming of age ceremonies, where young people are asked to think 
about their responsibilities to members of their community. There is a fusion of a moral life and a spiritual life, a belief that we have obligations to our ancestors and obligations to our descendants. I want to just underline that the meaning of achievement and caring and happiness varies quite a lot across race, class, and culture. Um, for many kids, achievement is not about getting into a selective college. It, is, it has an ethical purpose, low-income kids especially. It is about supporting their families and giving back to their communities. In African-American communities, you often don't see this hyper-individualism. There are long traditions of collectivism in African-American communities. In many immigrant communities, you see deep commitments to care and to collectivism. There's, idea out there, there's an idea out there on the airwaves that immigrant families are a threat to America's moral culture. But immigrant families, the data suggests, represent what is best about America's moral culture. So there are these important differences, but this much seems clear. Too many of us as adults and educators have neglected to do the fundamental work of raising children who, we, who are concerned about others and deeply invested in the common good. We have lived in the age of morality light, and we are seeing now the cost of that neglect. There is much, though, as educators that we can do, and I want to briefly describe a few core challenges at the heart of this work. The first challenge is to combat moral relativism. There is a pervasive perception not only that everyone has the right to their opinion, but that all opinions and views are equal, that one person cannot judge another person's values. But think about how dangerous this moral relativism is. Huge numbers of Americans did not understand in the context of Charlottesville the difference between the opinions and views of those who marched in the name of protecting one's rights and the views of those who marched in the name of destroying those rights. The difference between marching for, huma for humanity and marching against it. There are universal principles of fairness and justice that are based in human rights, the right to freedom from degradation that are critically important for our, under for our students to understand and embrace. It is these principles that give them a basis, a higher perch for resisting racism and sexism and discrimination against LGBTQIA Americans. It is these principles that help people understand that they are not only citizens of this country, but citizens of this world with obligations to refugees and immigrants and those who are vulnerable in distant countries. At the same time, it is critical that we guide our students in engaging constructively those who don't share their religious or political beliefs. It is hard to find a school system in this country where students are regularly confronted with political views that are different from their own and taught to engage those views constructively. My kids went to the Cambridge Public Schools and I don't think they were ever confronted with a solid case for a conservative point of view. That's true in many conservative communities in this country, that they are never presented with a solid case for a liberal point of view. But we need to help our students avoid the smug, easy gratifications of demonizing others and help them understand that we are all at risk of being blind and self-righteous. We can help them understand another vital moral principle that each one of us is responsible to at least try to find the dignity in those who we may fiercely disagree with, that each one of us is responsible for all of us, that we are individual stories, but we are also part of a common story. Both Pre President Obama and the late John McCain asked us to uphold this principle. Finally, we can develop in our children key social, emotional, and ethical capacities. We know a great deal about how to teach empathy, how to create caring, inclusive school cultures that cultivate, cultivate in children a deeper sense of responsibility for others, how to enable students to combat racism and misogyny and other forms of bias. Many of us at Making Caring Common, as well as other faculty here, Dana McCoy, who you just heard from, Gretchen Brian Mizell, Zali El Amin, Stephanie Jones, Mira Levinson, many of us are engaged in this work. 
And here's the good news. There's a great deal that we can do to build these capacities that is not expensive or a heavy lift for educators to implement. And rather than draining attention from academic achievement, this work can make classrooms more vibrant and more compelling. What this work does demand instead is something that other generations of adults and many other countries see clearly, that we are far more intentional and deliberate about our profound and fundamental responsibility to raise children who are generous and humane and able to sacrifice for principles larger than themselves. Let us get on with this work. Let us do it for our children. Let us do it for our own souls. Let us do it for our brave and beautiful experiment in democracy. Thank you.